Okay, so here we are uh, continuing on from our previous uh, lecture video, looking more into prehistoric religion and various features about it. And so where I wanna pick up here is um, the rise of Proto-Indo-Europeans. Uh, they're often referred to as the Aryan tribes that start spreading, um, they, leaving the region of uh, what was used to be known as Scythia, north of the Black Sea. And, uh, and they spread into India, the Mediterranean, and also into Europe. And one key thing uh, about them, a number of key things, is that they had, first of all, domesticated horses. So they were horsemen, women, <laughs> and as well as a wheeled wagon. So inventing the wheel and then having wagons that they pull. And they also used metal weapons. So as a whole, this allowed for much greater mobility and uh, they could uh, then access large territories uh, for cattle, sheep, goats, which was their main economy and main source of food, all right? And so they would spread outward and that entailed then conquests from time to time. And that starts to increase as they go into different regions. So the result of this is that we see, start seeing associated with these tribes are more gods of war, uh, their wearing of weapons, they're identifying with powerful animals in a symbolic way that is tied in with conquest. The rise of a priestly class along with warriors, a warrior class, and increased specialization of labor and a separation of social classes. And that really is very, becomes very evident in India with the caste system that develops out of this uh, because of their influence. Um, and so these Indo-European tribes were of course patriarchal as most uh, societies were. And because herd and cattle, sheep, whatever, were their main source of income, uh, things were quite volatile for them potentially economically in the sense that their herd easily could be raided, stolen by others. So of course they'd need protection and there could be conflict over the stealing and raiding of the herds, but also they could become uh, diseased rather quickly. Something could spread rather quickly and kill off, you know, all the uh, offspring or the herd. And so because it's their major source of wealth, when they're healthy, that wealth could double in size in the spring, you know, with the new calves being born or whatever, right? Um, but then also could uh, deteriorate very quickly. So, so there's a lot of volatility here when the economy is based on animals like this. Then you also had the issue of the need for manpower to take care of the herd. Uh, they would need to be sold, traded, slaughtered, and stored, perhaps loaned out. Uh, there could be debt as a result of that. That then could result in slavery. And also then, uh, you know, major inequities here could take place or inequalities in terms of health. So we have here also the rise of chiefdoms, those who are more in power and wealthier over those who are not uh, as wealthy. Um, and again, obviously, because animals are so mobile, it's easy to steal them. Uh, to raid them, right? As opposed to coming in to try to steal some of your grains. Uh, it's a lot easier to steal, you know, open up the pen and let the cattle out and steal them. So the result is that there's a need for uh, more warriors because there could be battles that would take place in this regard. And they also could steal women. <clears throat> Okay, and so women then would need protection against these warring tribes that might come in to steal your goods or even steal your cattle and steal your women. So you have these sorts of dynamics at play here. So here's just a picture of, um, you know, again with horses and a chariot and wagons and, and whatnot and a bit of a map of the spread and migration of these Indo-European tribes of various sorts. And there's a lot we don't know about, you know, history in this time period, that's for sure. So much that we do know or present is often quite conjectural, okay? So we need to always be a little bit humble in terms of making claims about things in the ancient past. Um, but one thing we find here <clears throat> is um, creation myths amongst these pastoralists that depend upon cattle for food tend to revolve more around the sacrifice of an animal or a god of some kind and that the life force of that being okay becomes the life force of the world and so the creation myth then would often be reenacted all right, in some way, uh, involving the killing of animals for food as a type of ritual of sacrifice to receive that life force, right? Uh, to bring it into this world, that life, that creative life energy 
of, of the sacrifice of an animal or being that lent, uh, resulted in the creation of this world. And then to honor the origins of that out of gratitude, thank you for the life that we get here. And that the sacrifice of life is then the source of life in a sense. And so animal sacrifice becomes paramount here in these circles. And we see this evident, even like here, there's a picture there from um, the Indian Hindu tradition of the sacrifice of the god Purusha, who then uh, gave birth to the whole world, or the whole world is a result of that sacrifice. And that even the different social classes that are there in the Hindu caste system is a result of the sacrifice of Purusha. And that, you know, the mouth represented the highest class of the Brahmin priests, the arms of the ruling warrior class of the Kshatriyas, the legs were that of the Vaishyas, they were the ones who were the merchants, the, who looked after the farms, the cattle, and whatnot. And then the feet were the laborers, the sudras are basically the servants of the upper three classes. And um, so anyways, yeah, we do find these sorts of things now here in, in this, um, with this trend, uh, or associated with these tribes. Also, we see that, you know, again, it has its roots in ancient shamanism, but an emphasis on that warriors could come into power by drinking substances, by going into an altered state of consciousness and can then experience themselves as being transformed into an animal power that they can then use and call upon to win when they go into battle. Okay. And we've already, I think, seen or I mentioned it elsewhere that shamans, you know, would use such substances to enter into the world of spirits, but also to become an animal spirit. And you see this in a lot of indigenous cultures of um, becoming that power animal. And that's why they'd wear the clothing, like wear the skin of a bear or that of a wolf or what have you, and do a dance and literally try to become that animal, right? And that goes back to, you know, all kinds of teachings about shape shifting, and that it's possible to literally become an animal uh, in, in certain regards. And so you have then this idea of these sort of drinks of immortality, right? Uh, they're drinks of power that can make you like one of the gods. And we find this in many cultures so that, for example, in India, soma is the substance that would be used. And again, we're not clear on what it is, but it was something that was grown in the forests, in the mountains. Many think it's a type of mushroom, uh, but we don't know for sure. And, uh, and it's held that A, to drink this gives you a vision of the gods. You enter into the world of the spirits and the gods. And it also gives you strength and power. And you become immortal like the gods. And it's held that Indra, the god of power, uh, bought, brought in by the, these ancient tribes into India. Uh, Indra drank this. And this is how he became a god of such power. And by drinking this, this is what also made him a god and gave him immortality. And you find this kind of idea of some kind of substance that can, is a source of immortality. And you even have it, you know, I'm kind of going on a bit of a tangent here, but uh, in the Garden of Eden story, in Genesis, in the Bible, uh, you know, the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were there, and they drank the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which they weren't supposed to, but there was also another tree there called the tree of life, the tree of life. And indicating that that was sort of a tree that could bring you immortality. Okay. So you have these sorts of stories and traditions across many cultures in various ways. Uh, substances that would be used that could have such power in, you know, uh, uh, bringing you, you know, even in terms of alchemy, uh, the philosopher's stone, you know, if you could find the kind of magic combination of transforming base metals into gold, but it also could bring you not only wealth, but also immortality. And you see that within alchemy, both in the West and also in China, in Chinese alchemy, it was believed by ingesting certain substances, you could literally become physically immortal, that this physical body would not undergo death. So you've got all kinds of teachings and traditions here <laughs> uh, in, in this regard. Okay. Um, all right, and uh, yeah, uh, well, you can read the rest of the slide here, but I just want to highlight some of this. Okay, again, there's so much involved with so many things here. This is just all, again, introduction of some ideas. Uh, we also find here the idea that, yes, there are many gods, 
okay, that polytheism is always sort of the norm, but a belief that there really is one that's the main God, uh, the supreme God, the chief God, the most powerful God, okay. And um, so what we is quite typical, the gods are more human-like, they're more anthropomorphic. Um, they uh, reflect various human roles uh, associated with different roles that we have in our lives. Like this is a God that's the one for the blacksmiths. This was a God that's good for the hunters, uh, for warriors, for lovers. Um, and so they can empower you in those different roles that you take in life, that you can call upon them. Okay. They have special specializations <laughs> and special areas that they're responsible for, okay, on an energetic spiritual level that you can tap into. <clears throat> and so that's kind of, again, kind of expanding beyond uh, of the idea that this is the God associated with the sun, this is the one associated with rain, uh, this is the one with associated with the daytime, daylight, another one associated with a bull. You know, you can have a variety of things here associated with different aspects of nature, right? Where they're forces of nature to becoming more human-like and personified in certain figures like Zeus or Indra. Uh, they take on more and more anthropomorphic kind of uh, features and qualities. Okay. So we'll have here Indra is sort of the king of the gods in India, Zeus over in amongst, amongst the Greeks as sort of the, the number one dude over there. Um, and uh, and he, you even see this say in the history of Judaism, the God of Abraham is the God that we're associated. He's our number one God and eventually will become you know, the God of the, the world. <laughs> Okay. But you have this kind of tendency. Whoops. And so we find many gods of war showing up here. Um, you know, at Nergal, you've got there on the left, Mars in the middle, Indra on the right. Uh, in terms of, you know, say, uh, going from the Mesopotamian world into going into more the Greco Roman world and of over in India. Okay. Uh, the emphasis on sky gods as sort of a king of the gods also showing up like Zeus, Mercury. Right? So again, you can see how they're becoming more and more anthropomorphic here. Oops. Um, however, it does, you know, and again, this is really quite complex, okay? But um, it's also held that you do find quite all over the world, the idea that there is a, celestial kind of being, more of a heavenly being that generally is always, tends to always be seen as being the creator, right? And is responsible for life on earth, uh, for the ongoing process of life on earth, who is also seen as being all knowing, the giver of moral laws, okay? And that there be order in society, moral order is established. And they're usually associated with heaven, the sky, in the upper realm in one way or another, right? That really is quite universal. So even like in China, you know, he's even literally called heaven or earlier the Lord on high to eventually become known as the Jade Emperor, but is the one that oversees the moral order of the universe. Vish, uh, uh, Varuna in India was the one that oversaw the moral order in the world and was up there in heaven in a palace up there in heaven um you know it's quite quite widespread this sort of idea and of course you have it you know in, in the whole biblical tradition in the west right but the sky and and the heavens is sort of perfect to kind of convey the concept of transcendence of a being that is above and beyond higher and greater right than what takes place here on earth and therefore being, in a sense, transcendent above in the heavenly realms is then in a sense uh, of being more eternal and unchanging and all powerful. Because it's just like, you know, the stars, the planets, you know, they seem to be always there no matter what changes happen here on earth day in and day out. The weather may change, but there's always going to be the sun. There's always the moon. They always show up on a regular basis. There's a sense of it being ongoing, eternal and unchanging. All right. And so that kind of is all associated with the heavenly realm. All right. 
but it does kind of blend in with the elements of the heavens like thunder, storm, wind, the rainbow, lightning, comets, all that. But those kind of elements start to fade more as time goes on. And the idea of the heavenly being up there in the sky is being more transcendent as you have more of a shift away from personification of forces in nature to the idea of a divine being being more transcendent, okay, as a creator of it all seems to be happening. But what we also see evident in a lot of very ancient kind of sort of especially tribal type of um, more indigenous um, beliefs and whatnot is that you know in in you know pre-literary tribes of various kinds it's really quite common that there's an idea of some kind of higher creator the great spirit uh up there out there who's supreme but generally is held to be rather distant and far away right it's quite removed and distant um and doesn't really need to be worshipped, just known that that being is there and is indeed supreme. Okay. And so, but in terms of ritual practices, we find people focus more on things that is closer to home, okay, uh, of things of immediate concern. So it's like, listen, we really need rain to come because it's kind of dry and there's a drought. So we'll call upon the rain God to bring the rain and we'll do rituals to call upon that. Or, you know, oh, geez, I'm not able to have a baby. It seems like I'm not able to have a baby. And we need to call upon some kind of special spirit that can help me to get pregnant, to have a baby or to have a healthy baby. Uh, and then, you know, spirits that can bring about healing and prosperity, protection from harm. You know, there's greater emphasis on closer um, spirits and gods with a small g, Okay, that can really help me out in the immediate needs that I have in my daily life. Whereas the Supreme Creator, there's this sense is kind of distant up there, looks after the whole universe on a grand scale, but not really somebody I can call on to help me in my immediate needs here and now. Okay, and you kind of find that sort of dichotomy, even in really ancient times. But even like, say, for example, today, so that today, you know, I don't know, say in the Catholic tradition, you've got all kinds of saints, you know, a saint for, and I'm, I'm really not all that familiar with it because I'm not Catholic or anything, but, you know, a saint for this, a saint for that, a saint that will bring you good luck for, you know, maybe on the ship, you know, if you go out to sea and another saint that will help you find something that you've lost maybe or something, you know, there'll be saints that you will call upon for those sort of more immediate little things as opposed to God, right? And, and you'll find that tendency happening in the history of religion and it's something quite ancient. Hopefully this makes a bit of sense, all right? It's just, again, just highlighting a few things. Um, yeah, so we find uh, the idea of, of, and again, I'm kind of blending, you know, things from different sources, right? Um, some of this is what um, Erce Eliade that I mentioned before really highlights is that indeed there was an even a Rodney Stark, you know, in the book on discovering God, he emphasizes that too, is that um, anthropologists have found in the study of a lot of tribal traditions uh, that it is a sense of a supreme being there, but, you know, kind of a bit more always in the background, right? And, and it seems that that being is in the background and there's greater emphasis on those more immediate gods in ways associated with storm and rain and sun and whatever, whatever, and the ongoing cycle of rebirth and fertility. Um, and you see that especially in agricultural societies. And so that will kind of, kind of continue on in ways. And you have a, always a bit of a dance happening throughout history in ways of the idea of one supreme being and then polytheism, a type of monotheism and polytheism. It's a kind of a dance that goes back and forth in terms of emphasis. It shows up in different ways historically, right? And yet, you know, it's just too simplistic to think it's simply a move of from polytheism to monotheism or just monotheism degrading down to polytheism 
is like a bit of ele mixed elements of both going on in different places. All right, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's probably best not even to talk about it really because it's really quite complicated and, and diverse. All right, anyways. Um, so here you'll find things like different kind of connections happening that the sun is really just the eye represents the eye of the supreme being or maybe is the son of the supreme being or references to the rainbow being the brother of the sun and uh, and uh, that the sun is actually the son of the supreme being uh, you know or of being of the other eye of the supreme being or that you know uh, the, the, the daughter of the sun or wife of the sun you have this kind of again they're trying to it seems throughout time that in terms of the development of stories and mythologies you kind of get people coming up with these sorts of family connections they're trying to harmonize and figure out how do the different forces of a nature relate to divinity is there one divinity many gods how do we figure this out and you'll get all kinds of different teachings and stories in various ways as people are dancing with this idea of many gods are one supreme God and how do they relate to each other, okay? It's just rather complex and it's not like there's any one answer to this. It's, it's a bit of a mess really, okay? But this is what you see. It's just hu humanity exploring and trying to uh, figure this out. Right? What is the relationship between all of this? between the natural world and the transcendent spiritual world and these spiritual forces. How do they relate and connect? How do we understand it? Uh, often uh, little attention and ritual compared to the moon. Yeah, there's far more rituals associated with moon and the cycles of the moon because that's a little bit more immediate because the moon goes through its cycle every month, every month, every month. And that's why there's a lot more rituals that way. Whereas the sun is a slower progression throughout the year and you'll have larger rituals but done fewer times throughout the year. So you get like major ones in winter solstice and summer solstice and spring and fall equinoxes and you know things like that. But whereas throughout the month, the moon goes through four major cycles every month. And so you'll even see this, and this is why if you, you know, look at Wicca and modern day paganism, you know, it's, that's how it shows up. Uh, they'll have their calendar of rituals that are the larger ones throughout the year associated with the sun, but then they'll have their, they pretty much could do weekly <laughs> rituals associated with the moon. Uh, but what we do find, which is something interesting here too, is that sun worship tends to be associated more with the elite, okay? And uh, a predominant theme shows up as to how the sun is worshipped uh, amongst the elite predominantly, amongst chieftains, kings, emperors, and often in, involve, is involved in some way as their initiation, okay? And, uh, and you'll see this also in terms of the funerary rites, especially like you're looking at Egyptians and whatnot, uh, in the temple religions, that for the royal class, their relationship to the sun is key. And they're often held to almost be like the son of the sun, you know, that they are descendants of the sun deity. Okay, you'll see this. Um, a second element we find happening here over time, especially we'll see this as, um, as we get into around, you know, maybe six, 500 BC or so. The second is how this concept of the sun gets increasingly rationalized as representing the fire of intelligence, a type of cosmic principle of consciousness of reasoning, rationality, so that here in the Western traditions coming out of the Greek Roman world of the concept of the Logos, and over in India as Brahman in an impersonal sense as the uh, supreme consciousness that is the source of creation. Okay, they're both seen as the fundamental principle directing the creative process. Okay, so that is something that happens with respect to the sun over time. And that's again, much later period, right? This is when we get the beginnings of writing developing and, and civilization developing. Uh, and so here, you know, it, it gets really developed around 600 BC or so, these kinds of ideas. 
another theme here that shows up is that the agriculturalists, okay, uh, eventually get overrun here by nomadic tribes in a lot of ways, or there's a sense of the presence of these nomadic tribes. And so the deities that were associated with the fertility of the land of the agriculturalists over time seem to become increasingly nature spirits. They evolved to become down the road, fairies, nymphs, pans, satires, you know, spirits of this world, of the earth and nature spirit, the water spirit, you know, uh, a fire spirit, uh, the elementals, spirits of the elements in a sense, okay, as opposed to the sky god. That's something that seems to come in here, you know, with these, you know, tribal kind of influx. You can call them invasions, you know, as kind of invading, sometimes conquest, sometimes just assimilation, a gradual assimilation happens. You know, it's really quite a mix of things. And again, we're always talking about thousands of years of history, dear people, right? There's a lot involved here, but just this kind of trend. So what you have here is the continued traditions of harvest celebrations in the field, working with the moon, drawing down the moon energy to enhance the growth and fertility of the crops, right? And again, you gotta keep in mind the power of the moon on the planet is huge. And people realized that and worked with that in ancient times and, and even still today. Like you look, pick up a farmer's almanac, you'll see that when you're to plant seeds in alignment with the moon energy at the time, okay? Um, so anyways, the commoners, the, you know, the people working on the land largely look to these spirits for healing, for safety, for good luck, etc. cetera, okay? Uh, whereas those who were in power they then tend to look more to the higher gods of the heavens for things. So that's where you'll have, you know, the relig folk religion, the religion of the people, the masses, that's more tied in with the land and the working of the land, all right? But you often associate with paganism. And then the religion of those who are in power, they're gonna become the temple state religions. And they look to more to the gods of the heavens. Right. And they, there's going to become then the basis of official religion that gets established down the road. Okay, so it's something to keep in mind because that's still even very much in play today in a lot of ways. Oops. Okay, oh, here's just a picture of some, you know, fairies, water spirits known as nymphs. Uh, there's Pan uh, from the Greco Roman world, and then fairies up there with the little wings, and then elves, you know, they have the pointed ears. You can always see the pointed ears of an elf, right? But you'll find that, you know, these sorts of traditions, and they're the earth people, you know, uh, the elves are the earth people, the fairies are of the, of the air, they're spirit, air spirits in a sense, right? And the nymphs are the water spirits. I don't have a picture of a, of a fire spirit, but you get this, uh, and Pan is again, more of the earth and of the animals and, and earth in a sense, oops. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the moon is very important here. It you know waxes and wanes, disappears and returns. And so it represents kind of uh, the cycles of life, uh, the law of becoming, that there's an ongoing cycle of birth and death and rebirth, right? And it's also very much connected with the life cycle here on earth with vegetation uh, and women's menstruation. Usually women menstruate at the time of the full moon, the when the, the, the moon is full, that pulls the tides of the water, the fluids on this planet, and therefore the fluids in a woman's body. And so there are these fundamental rhythms of life. And so it seems like the moon has magic power. It, people can actually feel its presence. That's why they go crazy at the time of a full moon. <laughs> you know, they always say the hospitals get kind of full. The police are super busy. Uh, people become lunatics, right? From the word lunar, uh, they start going crazy at that time, right? It influences human life and the, the planet in a very profound way. And so you'll find this, uh, 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 the power of the moon, guys, I already mentioned the farmer's almanac, you know, in terms of when you plant your seeds, but also to when you hunt and grow and all that, it's very important, the influence of the moon. And so it's very much associated with water, right? Uh, because the moon can so influence water. So uh, a very ancient symbol that we find all over the place is that of a spiral. And it tends to be associated with fertility and with the female, uh, often representing kind of the, the vulva and therefore the whole process of giving birth. And the spiral also is kind of associated with the sense of cycle, 
the cycles of life, the cycle of rain that brings life, the cycle of the tides, the cycle of the seasons, right? And so then there's this connection between the moon and water, the moon and women, right? And so you'll get uh, like in the Rig Veda, it says the moon is in the water. Rain comes from the moon. Okay, that's from the Brahmanas, another Hindu text. Okay. Uh, the Persian goddess was of the rain and the moon, kind of a blending of the two. The Babylonian moon god Sin governed the waters. Uh, and various tribes, American Indian tribes, Mexico, Brazil, whatever, th there's a moon god or goddess who oversees the waters. And similar ideas prevalent elsewhere. And then to the right, it's just a little symbol of um, that kind of connection. It's usually, usually actually used more by pagans today that represents the female with a spiral image there in the vulva region in where she would give birth. And then the cycles of the moon, the phases of the moon. And so it's very much then associated with fertility. So in Brazil, uh, they call the moon the mother of grasses. It causes the grass to grow, gives birth to the grasses. Okay, uh, in Iran, the moon's warmth is what causes plants to grow. And likewise, in many other cultures there, you can see that it's, uh, it's believed that, you know, grass grows on the moon, a lot of different stories like that. French peasants would sow the seeds on the new moon. Well, that's again, that's a part of the almanac kind of idea, right? When you should pick your fruit, uh, prune, sow seeds, etc. right? When that all should happen. And again, various deities uh, across culture, east and west, uh, with associated with the moon and plant life, water and agriculture, they tend to be blend together, okay? And, uh, and that also tends to be associated with immortality, that since the cycle of the moon is of death and rebirth, death and rebirth, then it's also then associated with immortality. Oops. We also then have LinkedIn here, uh, some snake symbolism. <laughs> Because you'll find across many cultures the idea that because the snake sheds its skin, it looks as though it's being reborn. And that element of uh, shedding the skin is seen as a symbol, again, of rebirth and immortality. And therefore, it's a type of moon force or moon energy that can bring fertility. Also, for some reason, it's held to be tied in with wisdom in certain cultures. And you also have it associated in this regard with immortality of that uh, it was in some way responsible in assisting the stealing of immortality or the preserving of immortality or presenting the wisdom of how to attain immortality. You've got various stories there uh, with respect to that, but tied in also with water and flood myths. So you've got the story of the flood uh, by Noah, but also in the Garden of Eden, the story of the serpent in the garden, telling Eve that if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall become like God. Okay, uh, you got that kind of story, but then you'll have, anyway, there's many, I could go on here, but the Sumerian epic, uh, Gilgamesh epic, has sort of the story as well about the flood myth and the plant of immortality being stolen and the role of a serpent in there. Um, and then you have uh, also from the biblical tradition, Leviathan is sort of the sea serpent monster uh, references to it there. And it represents the waters of chaos and is actually an enemy of order and therefore an enemy of God. And so you get the link there of the serpent being uh, uh, the one that brings destruction and chaos and therefore is more associated with what eventually becomes known as Satan, as the adversary, the accuser, a type of enemy of God. But you've got many traditions about serpents and then leads into dragons. Whoops, yeah, okay, so I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Whoops, oh dear, which way am I going? No, I did that. I'm going backwards here. No, I'm going, I don't know which way I'm going. St. George. Um, and here, for example, yeah, yeah, a couple of things here I'll just mention. Um, you know, then you've got all the, in the West, especially all these traditions of a dragon slayer that develops in the West and where St. George epitomizes that. And just, I'll just read here 
in the little blurb on the right here, St. George was a soldier in Diocletian's army that was a Roman emperor who hated Christians and killed them. Like there was, there was a lot of martyrdom, Christians being put to death for the faith. It was illegal uh, before Christianity was legalized by the conversion of Emperor Constantine, right? So George was a soldier in the army. Oh, was also a soldier, but also a Christian. And, uh, and he refused to engage in this and opposed the emperor and held that he was being cruel. And he resigned from the Roman army. And for this, he was then tortured and beheaded. And so then he became honored by soldiers everywhere for his bravery of standing up to the emperor at that time. And so he then is usually depicted as fighting the enemy of Christ. And that was represented by a dragon. But what's interesting as well as you'll have this idea of uh, slaying the dragon it, it, you, you know there's certain uh, I, I don't know if i have this in, in another slide at some point somewhere down the road or something somewhere i've got on this but in the chinese tradition is held that there are these force fields under the earth or what many call ley lines and there are these energy lines that move throughout the earth and you need to tune in to those energy lines under the earth when you build your buildings and whatnot, whatnot. And so, and there seems to be a similar bit of a belief like that in the West and they call it the dragon, okay? Uh, the, the sort of like a dra the dragons under the earth. There are these fields of energy that flow under the earth, okay? And uh, that we often refer to as ley lines, L-E-Y, ley lines. Well, in uh, certain cathedrals, there is, you know, a certain spot where there'll be then a plaque there that indicates where they staked a, 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 a spear, a sword, and they call it kind of like, uh, referred to as like slaying the dragon in the land over to where they would build then a cathedral and where they claim that they pierce the land there to pierce through the energy of that land that they also call like a dragon uh, and attributing it, it to St. George, who is a dragon slayer, piercing it there to hold the energy there so that this would be a solid energy for building the cathedral. So that's kind of interesting. I found that always interesting, that kind of connection. And I know I have something on that somewhere and I'll make sure to bring that up when I find it. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to bring that up here. Okay. So um, we have then, all right, no, I didn't, oh yeah, just to continue on here with the connection between the moon, women, fertility and whatnot, and snakes, and, yeah, that idea. Uh, so the moon brings menstruation as well. So the female is then fertile, right? So if for a woman to become fertile, she needs to menstruate because when you're, you know, in menopause, uh, you no longer menstruate, therefore you're no longer fertile. And so then the idea that, fertility and it becomes associated as well with the snake in various ways in that the snake is associated gets associated with rebirth with renewal with fertility and also can easily represent a phallic type symbol just by you know the shape of the snake right and beliefs develop in various cultures that a snake can impregnate females or that a person, a man could become a snake to impregnate the female. I mean, the penis kind of looks like a bit of a snake, right? So you get different uh, stories and traditions and myths and whatnot that in es among the es Eskimos, it was held that unmarried girls should not look at the moon because they could get pregnant if they do so. So is that, again, that kind of relationship happening? Uh, in Australia, India, there's a uh, belief so that the moon brings fertility to the earth and can be a seductive uh, that men then can easily impregnate girls during that time. Uh, it, various cultures, you can see there, Italy, Greeks, Romans, Japan, China, Africa. The serpent copulates with women is a possibility and a danger. Uh, there was a tradition in Europe that uh, their fear that if you go to sleep with your mouth open, a snake could enter in and you'd become pregnant. Uh, in India, if you want a baby, you should adore and worship the cobra, and that could make you then fertile. Um, uh, rabbinic, uh, there's a rabbinic tradition that had taught that uh, uh, menstruation is a result of Eve having had relations with a serpent. Okay, So you've got all kinds of little stories in those kind of connections here. And so then 
connecting some of these things, you get then goddesses, all right, associated again with women and fertility, also tied in with snakes in various cultures, so a type of snake goddess. So there below here on the left, you can see an Indian snake uh, goddess there, uh, Egyptian snake goddess in the middle, and then to the right, Minoan. Okay, there you got uh, this sort of element happening here. And so you get then the connection between the moon, the snakes, and magic. And this is just a little bit of a longer spiel, just highlighting to you some of these connections that develop over time, just associated with the moon, right? How widespread ideas can become in various ways and the, the different connections that can develop in, in the history of religion, so to speak. Okay, just this just give you a bit of an idea of what can all happen here, okay? So you'll have here in a Mediterranean region, many deities associated with snakes. And the snakes in their hand, Artemis, Hecate, Persephone, or snakes in the hair like Medusa. Up there, you've got a picture of Medusa. Uh, European traditions that when, when women are menstruating, they can pull their hair out, bury it, and that hair will then become a snake. Uh, Retin hair of a witch could turn into a snake. Uh, the moon has magic power of change. And so, uh, because the moon can bring about magic power of change, it then gets linked, obviously, to magic, and therefore witches who know how to work magic. So then we always get this link between witches and the moon, right? Uh, so much uh, to hear that the, in Hebrew and Arabic words for magic come from words that mean snakes. Okay, so you get these kind of links. And, and then even, you know, somebody that you think is a snake, that they're deceptive, uh, they're out to deceive you. And that, and that is also associated with magic kind of getting a bad rap that's often used for evil, dark purposes of trying to fool you, trick you, do things to you without your knowing, bring change in your life without your having given permission for that change or for you having instigated that change as somebody else is hexing you, right? They're bringing about changes in your life that you do not want or didn't cause to bring about yourself. So you think that somebody maybe cursed you or did it to you, right? And so it's somewhat deceptive. So you get that kind of connection all going on here. Okay, and I think this is going to be wrapping up soon here, but again, just to follow through with these sorts of connections, you see all kinds of patterns with variations, combinations that show up in various myths of linking serpents, dragons, snakes to be associated with water, you know, clouds, rain, living in an ocean, springs, rivers, you know, again, all associated with water. So Indra slays the demon of drought. Okay, uh, Marduk came okay, with the ancient Babylonians. He slayed the demon Tiamat, uh, Tiamat uh, that brought about and then uh, allowed rains to come. Leviathan is also the enemy of God that is to be slain by God. Uh, the Mexican rain god here uh, is an image that again also associated. You can see the snake he holds in his hand. So you get these kinds of connections happening. Oops, 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 oops. All right. Well, then, as I mentioned earlier about immortality and whatnot, that you get this sort of kind of thing going on here with the moon. That, uh, that also you find throughout different cultures and historically and whatnot, an emphasis that the moon and the earth are connected in some way because they are of the same substance. That is, the earth is sort of like this round ball of matter. The moon is this round ball of matter up there in the sky. Whereas with the sun, you know, it's such radiating such light, you can't even look at it directly. It looks more like fire, and that the sun is really made of fire, whereas the moon seems to be made of the same substance as the earth, right? So that's where the sun seems to be different from the, from the moon, okay, in terms of just visually, right? And so is how that since we bury the dead in the earth, right, and, and there is a sense of the fe feminine, the goddess is more associated with the earth, and the male god as associated with the sun, the emperor up there in the heavens and transcendent, you kind of get that kind of bifurcation of male and female generally, right? So since the dead are buried, it's like they're returning to the womb of mother earth, uh, of, of the goddess in a sense, from which they came, that we were born out of this earth, right? And so then since the moon seems to be of the same substance, a belief that becomes you know, quite widespread in various ways is that the dead, you know, when they return to the earth and they're buried, they will then journey to the moon. 
And then from the moon, they could be reborn in a new form when they come back here to earth. Okay. And so then the snake is held, since the snake lives in the earth, it's sort of an earthbound creature living in the earth, buries itself in the earth in little caves and rocks and things, and is constantly reborn. And then often uh, snakes can often be associated with different funeral rituals as well. But what's really interesting here is that the idea of a journey of the soul is one of going to the moon. It's sort of like a lunar journey. So when you talk about connecting to your soul, it's sort of like you're also then connecting with moon energy in ways. So a lot of interesting connections here. So we see this idea that the moon is the place where the dead go to. Okay, when they die, it's the abode of the dead. You'll see this in the carvings of Assyrians, Babylonians, Hittites, Anatolian, Anatolians, in funeral monuments throughout the Roman Empire. In Europe, the half moon was often a funeral symbol. Uh, in India, the journey to the moon was called the path of souls. And that's where you go to await your future rebirth. Okay. However, that is for those who will reincarnate. But those who do not reincarnate, they will journey onward towards the sun. Okay, that's the path of the gods. They go beyond the moon to journey to the sun. Those of the initiated, those who have been set free from ignorance, those who actually know the true nature of the supreme being and the self as one with Brahman, the supreme being, right? The enlightened ones, they journey onward to the sun and therefore they will no longer be reborn. Okay, that's sort of uh, what develops in Hinduism there. Uh, in Zoroastrianism, souls cross a bridge to go then to the stars. The good will go to the moon, but then eventually they can go on to the sun and the most righteous will eventually go to become one, enter into the infinite light of Ahura Mazda, the supreme being. Okay. So there's a sense of a journey of ascension to higher levels, okay, from the moon to the sun and beyond. And only what's beyond the moon is beyond another rebirth, a beyond reincarnation, beyond coming back to earth again. Okay. And that's interesting. You find that both west and east. And so Plutarch, for example, okay, going back to the Greco Roman period, he died in the year, oh, well, beyond that, actually, Plutarch's more recent, died in year 120, held that at death, the souls of the just, okay, of the righteous people, were purified or then purified on the moon. Okay, their souls purified there on the moon, while their bodies will just simply return to the dust of the earth. But their mind, their intelligence, the intellect will journey on towards the sun. So there are a type of two deaths. There's first a death on earth with respect to your body. Then you journey on to the moon. And when the mind leaves the soul at the moon, that's a type of second death. Okay. Uh, on the moon, the soul will remain, but if, if there is a strong desire to come back to earth, then it can be reborn. But if there isn't, all right, if you don't want to be reborn and it's meant for you to continue on, the mind will then journey onward towards the sun. Okay, and then the soul at the moon will then, in a sense, pass away. Okay, so uh, the soul at the moon is only there awaiting uh, uh, another, if it wants to, if it's going to come back to earth, this, the mind needs to return back to the soul in order to impregnate it, and then it can come to earth in another bodily form. So it's rather, um, you know, again, it, it, an interesting kind of. Um, perspective here as to you know some of the ideas that are believed about the afterlife is there's a lot more to the afterlife that's believed in the past than what we think in more recent times uh, as i say that uh, you know things have become simplified and rather reductionistic <laughs> approach to things over time that uh, religions have in some ways become simplified okay well that's uh, it for today here on this and uh, yeah, just to give you a bit of an idea, <laughs> uh, and uh, I know it's a little bit maybe confusing, and it is confusing, because uh, there's a lot of teachings here, and I just want to just show you, really, and demonstrate a little bit the complexity of beliefs that there have existed, just to give you a little bit of a taste, 
and um, is far more complex than we realize. And there's all kinds of interconnections between things, all right, and, and how they maybe evolve a bit. And I just kind of tried to give you a bit of an example associated with the moon, the soul, uh, rebirth, fertility, water, serpents, you know, the, the whole kind of blending of ideas that take place across time and different cultures in various ways, just in this little area here just to give you a bit of an idea. And uh, so don't, you know, get too freaked out about the complexity of it. I know it's, it's not easy. All right. Okay, that's it for now.